to Fruity Knitting. I'm Madeline. And I'm Andrea. And this is episode 114. Fruity Knitting is a 90 minute program bringing you knitting inspiration from around the world as well as extra snippets of travel, history and storytelling to add joy to your life and bring a smile to your face. Yes. <laughs> so today's feature interview is all about knitting with wire to create gorgeous jewellery. This is an interview that Andrew and I did in London back in January 2020. And Soraya Hossein is the designer behind Malika and she makes exquisitely beautiful jewellery by knitting and crocheting with wire. And her designs use lots of beads, Swarovski crystals and small amounts of luxury hand dyed yarn. And I bought a jewellery making kit from Soraya at the Edinburgh Yarn Festival back in 2019. And after talking together, we both decided to do an interview, which we are finally now presenting to you in August 2021. So some things do take quite a lot of time. Mm. Well, Mum gave me that kit recently to knit up, which I have. I'm wearing it right now, as you might see. And I'll tell you a bit about my experience of knitting with wire. And we'll also show you some footage of me knitting the necklace from up close. Yeah. And in this episode, you're also going to meet another member of our Australian family. We're including a short 10 minute segment on how to get inspiration and how to combine colors. And this segment features my older sister, Michaela, who lives on a little island off the Gold Coast in Australia. So when Michaela was in her 20s, she did an art and design degree at RMIT in Melbourne. And then she worked for a few years in the textile design industry. And now she's teaching art and design to school kids. And some of the concepts that she's teaching in the, in the classroom, I thought would really interest some of our viewers. So we've put together a short 10 minute segment that I really hope inspires you. And on top of that, Madeline and I have brand new knitting projects to share with you, as well as some general chit chat and a little bit of news. So it's time for bring and brag because I've finished my shine mittens by Sophia Camerborn. Do you want They're to hold so one gorgeous. for me? They're so gorgeous. Yes, I love them, and I can't wait to wear them this winter. Um, yeah, so the first mitten, throughout the first mitten, I changed needle sizes a lot because I wasn't getting the correct gauge, and it was because I was knitting the color work way too tightly. So I made sure to write down the exact rows in which I changed needle sizes so that I could copy the same thing for the second mitten. Um, but despite doing that, my left mitten, so the second one, ended up being wider than the first. Yeah. And I think with practice, my overall tension just relaxed or something. Um, but mum was so kind, she soaked both mittens for 24 hours and then blocked them and stretched the right cuff to match the width of the left. And I think she did a pretty good job. Yeah, I think they're even now. Yes. I don't think you can tell too. anymore. Yeah. These are actually my first mittens. And you can see the colour works slightly lumpy bumpy, but you don't notice it too much. I think they look great. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I made these mittens to go particularly with my favourite dark blue winter coat. I have my evil eye on them. Yes, she <laughs> always has her evil eye on her <laughs> um, But I, I put on my coat despite the summer heat so I could model my mittens for you and we're going to show you some footage now. They look stunning. So we're going to move along now to under construction for an update on my Boha Stickning project, The Wild Apple. This completely stunning design is by Kirsten Olsen. And Kirsten Olsen was one of the main designers for Boha Stickning in the 50s and 60s. And she's actually still alive and knitting. And I think she lives in Gothenburg, which is on the west coast of Sweden. So this is one of her very earliest designs. And I think she was really trying to create the most beautiful artistic design she could without a lot of thought as to how many knitters would actually be able to knit it because it's also called the masterpiece and it uses up to four colors in one row whereas traditional Fair Island stranded knitting only ever uses two colors. So I'm going to stick it on so you can have a look. 
what it's going to look like. It's completely stunning, isn't it? It's beautiful. So in total, it uses 14 different colors in the yoke and 10 of those colors are different shades of green. Can you believe it? <laughs> green is my favorite color. You all know that. I can never get away from knitting green um, projects. There's always some green in one of my projects. Mums in paradise. Yes. So I actually feel that when she was designing this, she must have subconsciously had me in mind if I can be <laughs> arrogant enough to say that okay so you can see that the the yoke is knitted top downwards and that's a construction for most of the boho stickening designs and I've knitted about three quarters of my yoke and when I finished the depth of the yoke should be about 17 centimeters and I think I'm on track for doing that which is good and this design gives you an option of either doing a folded neck edge or a ribbed neck edge. And I've chosen the folded neck edge because I just thought that was going to make it look less casual and even more elegant. So to do that, I'll take this off again. I had to start with a uh, start with stocking stitch for about a centimetre and a half. And then I did a row of purl stitches and the, row, and the purl stitches create a really lovely crisp folding line for when you take the, the stocking stitch facing down afterwards and sew it behind. But because I did my facing on such a fine needle gauge, it's actually rolling forward quite tightly. And in a way, I quite like that rolled neck edge. So I mm. may even leave it like that, but I won't make that decision until right, till I finished everything and I can try it on and see. Here's a close-up picture of my yoke. I told you that it uses up to four colours in a row. I haven't been phased by that too much because in total there's only about four or five such rows, but most of the rows do use three colours per row, so the knitting is a lot slower than normal. There's also the typical boho stickening pearl stitches, which you should be able to see quite clearly in the photo. The pearl stitches bring a little bit of colour from the row below up into the new color on the row above and this makes the colors bleed or melt into each other more and you can see this effect particularly well when you view the pattern from more of a distance so not quite so close up as what I'm showing you in this photo. It's a bit like looking at an impressionist painting. So I'm really enjoying knitting this yoke. It is so pleasurable. Like I said, I'm not really daunted by the four colors in one row, but I'm really daunted about the idea of knitting the rest of the stocking stitch body and sleeves on a 2.25 millimeter needle. This is when I really wish I both had a knitting machine and knew how to use it because knitting these yokes is just such a pleasure and there's so many beautiful ones. I would just love to knit these gorgeous yokes and then just whip up the body and sleeve on a knitting machine. That would be the ideal combination. You'd get through them in no time. I know, and be pretty expensive too. <laughs> so the, just to give you an idea, the cuffs and the hem are gonna be knitted on a two millimeter needle. The body is 2.25 millimeters and I've been knitting the yoke on 2.5 millimeter. But I do appreciate why knitting at such a fun, this design at such a fine gauge is a good idea because it just it's it's so artistic and it just makes it even more beautiful and even more delicate so I'm quite happy to be doing that because in the long run I want this this jumper to look stunning and it's going to be an heirloom jumper so Madeline you can inherit it in about 30 years let me try it on you mm -hmm. I think the colors will look really good on you hang on because something's pulling yeah Yeah, see, the colours go with her eyes. You've got green eyes. That's going to look stunning on you as well. So it's going to sit more like that. Oh, it's very soft. It's super soft. Really soft. And like Penilla Silverberg said, this yarn is only going to get better over time. The Angora just will fluff up, and that means that all the colours will be blending even <laughs> more. So by the time you inherit it, the jumper's going to be at its peak. <laughs> like me. <laughs> I'm going to be at my peak at 50. <laughs> Are you? Okay. I plan on it. So, uh, so, yeah, so I'm going to definitely knit the sleeves a little bit longer for you so that they, they fit you. It's you. gorgeous, isn't it? I always ask mum to knit the sleeves longer because my arms are quite a bit longer than mum's. And, you know, you have so many, sometimes she's nice and gives them to me, but then they'll be too short on the arms. Yeah. And that's always a great shame. Okay. 
So as mum said, this episode includes a very cool interview with Soraya Hussain from Malika. Soraya designs knitted jewellery patterns made from wire, yarn and crystals. Mum bought one of her kits recently and gave it to me to knit up. Yep. This is the one I'm wearing. It's called Duality and it's one of her beginner friendly kits. It's called Duality because you can wear it as a necklace and also wrap it twice around your wrist to wear it as a bracelet. And this particular version with these colours is called Lakeside. So, yeah. It's stunning. Yeah. The wire... Here it is. It comes in this gorgeous gleaming copper color. I love it. And the crystals also come in different shades of copper and greeny blue. So the necklace only has four stitches on each row because you knit the necklace this way. And I used the cable cast on. I didn't practice getting the correct gauge too much because I was worried about running out of wire. And that's because you're not supposed to re... Yeah, that was stupid. There's heaps of wire left. <laughs> but you're not supposed to reuse the wire because it gets kinks and it wears out every time you undo and re-knit it. Yeah, so that's the reason. And you should make sure to knit more slowly and also really follow the pattern correctly the first time round. This was difficult for me because I tend to drift off and I just rely on unpicking my knitting. Um, and over time, your gauge got neater and neater, didn't it? It did, yes. So practice. Practice, don't worry about the wire. <laughs> and that was because you were pulling it tighter. Yeah. And that's, I figured that out in the end because I rewatched one of Soraya's tutorials and I saw that she pulled it a lot tighter than I thought. So yeah. that made my knitting look a bit neater. I had a go as well. And actually, by the end, your knitting was way neater than mine. Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we did take some footage of to show you mm -hmm. up close, Madeline knitting it, and you're going to give some tips as all the things that you've learned from... Based on my limited experience. <laughs> yeah, of wire knitting. Firstly, a fairly tight gauge looks neater, but you also have to be careful not to make it too tight. And getting this right was the main challenge for me. If the stitches are too loose, you look, they look uneven, but if they are too tight, you have trouble inserting your needle into the stitch. Soraya inserts her needle in pearl-wise first to loosen the stitch before knitting it, which was a really good tip, and you can see me doing that as well. I actually found it harder to count my rows with wire knitting than with wool knitting, so for me it was really important to keep a close eye on the pattern and note down every row I did, even though it meant I was constantly putting down my knitting to do so because I really wanted to avoid unpicking my knitting. One thing I'm still trying to figure out is how to make the crystal beads point to the same direction on each row. At the moment they're all pointing in slightly different directions and it would be nice to make them more uniform, but on this necklace you can't really notice it unless you look really closely so it doesn't bother me too much. Putting the clasps on the end was a bit more fiddly and we were worried that if I messed up we wouldn't be able to correct it very nicely, so mum took over. <laughs> I filmed her. <laughs> yeah, because sometimes, particularly right at the end, if it's if you get a little bit of a, a loopy bit, it's very hard to make that look neat. So I just thought, I'll, I'll do it. <laughs> it does, like I said, kink very quickly, so yeah. yeah. There is a section of plain knitting at each end of the necklace with no crystals, and these ends have to be sewn onto the clasp and chain, fitting the cast off edge around the circle. When you have done that, you thread the wire back through the plain knitting to the nearest crystal because you have to secure the end tip so it doesn't scratch your neck. You then wrap the wire through and around the crystal twice and snip the wire so the end hides inside the crystal. So I found it very fun and interesting to do this project. I've actually never made my own jewellery before. So I think this is a really, really cool way to do it. And since I have so much wire left, I might just make myself an extra pair of matching earrings as well. And in general, these make for great gifts. Look how good it looks doubled around as a bracelet. <laughs> yes, it does. It's gorgeous. I'm so glad that you knitted it up. Yeah, me too. Yeah, well done. It was done. very fun. So Soraya is offering Fruity Knitting patrons a 20% discount of all her products from her online store. She has make-it-yourself kits like the necklace that Madeline made, but she also has very beautiful ready-made jewellery if you don't want to make it yourself. And there's some extra things available as well like stitch markers and different types of supplies. So thank you very much to Soraya. So I've done well over 120 full feature interviews with many guests who are leaders in the industry 
And research through researching their work and talking to them, I've learned a lot about how professional makers and artists work. And then when we do our live events with our Shetland patrons, the patrons have an opportunity to ask the guests their own questions. And that's been interesting for me as well, because a lot of the questions that keep coming up are around the topics of how does the guest keep continuously getting inspiration and also how do they play with or combine colours. And I think some people have the impression that inspiration is somehow magical. It falls from the sky into the artist's head and then in a trance they produce a masterpiece. I think that does happen regularly but only to the real geniuses of the world and that's a very small percentile of the population. You'd probably be lucky to meet one in your lifetime. But there are some real techniques that professional artists and makers use so that they can keep creating a lot of content to deadlines. And it's similar with combining colours. There are some basic formulas that you can use that I think would be particularly or especially helpful to those knitters or crafters who are really freezing up about the idea of playing with colour or putting together sets of colours. And like I said, my sister Michaela is teaching art and design to school kids and she's joining us now in the next segment that's coming up and she's going to show you how she teaches 12 and 13 year old school kids of very mixed abilities and even mixed interest in the subject how to get inspiration on any particular subject and then come up with a fairly good result in a fairly short time. So I'm hoping that um, those of you who are struggling a bit with these concepts will feel a lot more confident after you see her talk about how she does this. So that's coming up now. And I hope you enjoy it. I'm a secondary art and design teacher and I live in Australia. I've been teaching students from ages 12 to 18 art related subjects for over 10 years. Before that I was a textile designer and designed for bed linen and fashion industries and I've also done some fine art painting and, and um, digital print work. As an art and design teacher I'm always thinking about how to inspire my students. I want them to feel successful and really proud of what they achieve. So I'm tr I try to come up with processes that will really support them in that. I think back to when I was a child and what would have been some of the guidance and tips that I would have liked to have heard to help me on my art journey. I um, had memories of being in school and in an art class and I really loved art and I remember the art teacher saying paint something from your imagination. I really struggled to come up with something and I sat there with my like blank table and nothing on the um, blackboard and just one or two masters paintings on the walls and, and dirty paint brushes in the sink and just nothing came to mind. It was a real struggle to be inspired. But then when I was doing a textile design degree course in my 20s, that it was then that I really learned that artists are nearly always inspired by something. So artists will collect um, items around them, favourite things, it could be greeting cards, it could be fabric samples, it could be a special artwork, um, photographs that they took. Uh, maybe a quote from a book 
and they would assemble these things together and pin them up on a board and that would be their starting place for um, coming up with a new painting, a new project. So when I am doing planning now for my classes, I'm always trying to provide these um, steps and inspiration to assist the students. So I thought I'd share with you a project that I've done with my grade eight students, which you can see around me here. And these are students that are about 13 years old, um, 12, 13. They may have done very little art in primary school and perhaps just a tiny bit in, in grade seven and maybe they haven't even painted before. But I decided to do a painting unit and I was thinking about an artist that would inspire them in a subject matter that they could relate to. The artist that I chose is Howard Arkley, born in Australia in 1951. He became very famous for his pop art paintings where he took sub, um, photographs of suburban Australian houses and he simplified these photographs into simple shapes and he painted them in very bright pop art inspired colours and he layered patterns over the top. So he took these mundane images and transformed them into uh, artworks that were really visually exciting. So Howard in his earlier years travelled to Europe and he travelled to France and he loved the architecture there and the um, amazing wrought iron doorways that the churches and cathedrals would have and or have and when he came back to Melbourne he sort of took a second look at Australian architecture housing architecture which isn't that exciting but he said you know we do have our own um, cultural aesthetic here and he started to be inspired by everything that he found around um, an average house on the outside and on the inside of the house. So for example, he was inspired by flywire screen doors. Um, all Australian houses have a flywire screen door on the front and the back, an essential item with all the flies that we have. And they often have really lovely decorated wrought iron. Um, so they've got great patterns. He was also inspired by um, driveway gates that also had metal strips in, in, in various swirls and patterns. He was inspired by the brickwork on the outside of houses and by the carpets designs and the um, decorated floral curtains and drapes and wallpapers and tablecloths and even doilies. So this was the, the starting point for um, this project that I did with these students. For the first lesson, I introduced the students to Howard Arkley and we looked at examples of his paintings of interiors and exteriors of houses. We looked at real estate websites and downloaded typical houses ranging from the 1950s up until present day. I asked them to take photos of the exterior of their own home or of a house that they had lived in. And if not, they could use these real estate photos. In the next class, the students did a simple drawing on an A3 sheet of paper, which matched the canvas board size that I had. After they did their drawing, I showed them how to transfer using carbon paper onto their canvas board. So moving on to the painting process, I showed the class a colour palette like this. And we talked about how colours that are close to each other on the colour wheel are called harmonious colours and how they are related and they give a, a calm, harmonious feeling. Because you can see that if you grab, say, this selection of colours, they all share something in common. So say from there to here, all of these colours have a tiny bit of red in them. Or from even here to here, all of these colours will have some blue in them, whether it's a lot or whether it's a little bit. So I asked them that, to paint their houses in a mostly warm selection of colours and to paint their backgrounds in, in mostly cool colours. 
In the classroom setting, I've got 22 students with not much space around the tables and carpet on the floor and one sink in the corner. So you can imagine 22 students walking around armed with their paint brushes and paint on it, looking for any excuse to move around the classroom and get more paint or clean their water containers. So the temptation to accidentally paint someone's arm or face or leg is just too much for them, it's irresistible. So I have learned just how easily it can get out of control. So I set the classroom up beforehand. Um, on the palettes that I put, poured out for them, for the warm colours they had like a lemon yellow, a warm yellow, bright pink, different reds and some white. And they were able to mix the colours and create different light and dark shades and different intensities of these colours. And they painted each shape within the house a different warm colour. That was the goal. They didn't always do that, but that's the general gist of it. Um, when it came to painting the background areas, I gave them blues and greens and white and they mixed up and mixed them up and tried to get light and dark tones. Some didn't, but generally they did. Um, then we used a selection of cardboard stencils and I've got some here. They, they were so easy to use and created a, a great result. They would lay the stencil over the top of the artwork take this one, they'll lay it like this over a section and then paint a contrasting colour over the top and then they just kept changing different patterns and did them in different areas. Some students um, did their own little um, pattern designs and I also had these stamps that would have been good to use but I didn't end up using them. So the finishing touch was to use thick and thin um, black felt texture and they, they really did it in the same style as the pop art cartoon style that the pop artists were using back then, that Howard Arkley was using. So that's a bit of an overview of how I structured a lesson, which enabled all of the students to achieve a really great result. Any student that attended the class each week and put a little effort in could achieve this, as you can see with these images. It didn't really matter overall how good their painting was and how easy they found it or not. Just the process was what supported them and having that inspiration there and the subject matter that they could relate to. There's a couple of key takeaways for all of us here today. Firstly, inspiration and secondly, in relation to colour. So inspiration, it's all around us. Take some time in your day-to-day -day life to look for interesting things around you and collect them, such as images, photos, wrapping papers, could be tissue box covers, uh, greeting cards, could be coasters of a design that you like, textiles. And then look for connections between these things and group them with similarities and contrasts. Uh, you might leave them on a table and keep rearranging them or you might pin them up on a board. For example, here are three lovely textiles that I bought when I was in Peru and you can see just selecting these three that are, are very different pieces, there is relationship between them. There's similarities, there's contrast in colour and pattern, and they could be a great inspiration for a colour scheme. So then in relation to colour, if you are fairly new with colour and haven't had a lot of experience or don't know where to start, get yourself a simple colour wheel like this one, and then look for three to five colours that are close together on the colour wheel. So harmonious colour schemes are some of my favourite. So if you could start with red, and then look for colours either side. And you could pick a few darker colours and then a couple of lighter tones and mid-tones and arrange them together. And I think you'll find they'll be quite uh, relaxing, easy on the eye. You can do it in the blues as well, or move around to the greens. If you then want to go a little bit further, something that I really like doing is getting 
your five colours, harmonious colours, get one of the centre colours, could be in the reds here, then go directly opposite in the colour wheel to greens. So you've got like three different shades of greens here, for example, you could pick the light one, the medium or the dark. And by doing that, you add in a complementary colour or a contrasting colour into your harmonious scheme. And it will give a really nice pop and interest to your colour scheme. So, but in the end, I think be willing to experiment, trust your gut feeling, and let your own creative individuality shine through. I hope I've given you some really interesting and useful tips and ideas. So welcome back. I hope you found that inspiring and or helpful in some way. I thought the kids' artwork looked fantastic when you put them all as a group up on the wall. Very yeah. vibrant. Yes. And my two favourite ones, personal favourites, are these two here. And I particularly like the house on stilts. That's a typical Queensland weatherboard house. I think the architecture looks very sweet, very cute. Yeah. That's because of all of the flooding. So after seeing all of this use of colour and combining colours, um, we're back to under construction and I'm going to show you my latest project, which unfortunately is only in one colour, but it is a really pretty colour, this colour here. So this design I've shown you pictures of quite a few times in previous episodes. It's a Kim Hargraves design and it comes from her book Covet and it is this really beautiful wraparound cardigan here called Devote. So it's a very simple stocking stitch design done in pieces and then sewn up and the recommended yarn is the Rowan Alpaca Soft DK. But I'm knitting my version in the John Arben Devonia DK in the colorway called Broken Flower. I've used the Devonia yarn range quite a few times and I really love it. You might remember Andrew knitting Madeline this design here. Yeah. He did such a gorgeous job. Yeah. This is also Devonia DK and the colorway for this is Amber Blaze. It's really rich and beautiful, isn't it? It's one of my favorite cardigans. It's actually the same color as the copper. That you've yeah. been, the copper wire you've yeah, been knitting that's true. with. Yeah, actually it would look stunning with that. Look at that. Beautiful. <laughs> okay, so Devo the Devonia yarn range comes in DK weight and fingering weight and it's a blend of Exmoor Blueface, Devon Blueface Lester and Devon Wensleydale and as John Arben likes to describe himself, the Exmoor Blueface gives the yarn a real, whoops, the fleece, the, the Exmoor Blueface fleece, gives the yarn a real bouncy springing feel. And the Devon Blueface Lester is a very fine yarn, uh, fleece, so it's going to make the, the yarn very soft. It's got a long staple, so that's good for making it into a worsted yarn. And it has a real sheen to it, which is great when you're dyeing a colour on that fleece. And then the Devon Wensleydale fleece is also very fine and soft with a long staple but it has a golden kind of creamy hue to the fleece so when you're dyeing all the colors all the colors will have this golden hue as an underline as a sort of background or base to, to, to the, all the shades which is gorgeous so as you can see I'm a good way towards finishing this design so the the back the back piece here the two fronts and the sleeves are all knitted flat. If you hold that bit there with mm -hmm. one hand, you can sort of see. They're all knitted flat and then sewn together, which I've done already. And then we have, oh, I'm going to try it on so you can see what it looks like. It smells gorgeous, by the way. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So there's quite a lot of Kim Hargrave design features in this design. The ribbing around the hem and cuffs starts off with some rows of fine garter stitch followed by some decorative holes before the actual 2x2 two two ribbing starts. And all the increases at the side seams of the body and the sleeves are done with yarn overs which create little decorative holes on either side of the seams. 
So I'm fitting it on over another jumper, but you can get a bit of an idea of how it's going to look. So it wraps around and it sits, whoopsie, I'm sitting on strings. It sits pretty <laughs> snug in your waist like this. It's going to be really gorgeous. At the moment, the two front bits are looking a little bit sloppy, but they will have a shawl collar sewn onto them. So that should tighten them up a little bit. So it's wrap around, like I said, and it's done up with two belts. I've completed one of the belts here. So that's the end of the belt. You can see it goes down to a peak. And the belts are knitted in garter stitch on the bias. That means that the garter stitch is lying diagonally, which makes it look flat, but also gives it a really nice kind of um, stretch. And the way she's achieved the diagonal is by increasing on one side and decreasing on the other side of, of every second row. So. Yeah, so I've done one belt. I still have another belt to do. And then we've got the two shawl collars, which are mirror image of each other. So they will be sewn on here and then going around. That'll look Around beautiful. the back like that, yeah. yeah. So what, what they're meant to do is have it is join together. So I'm still knitting this one here. They're meant to join with a seam at the back, but what I'm going to do is just graft them so together at the back so there's no seam. And as I said, they get sewn down to these side bits here. I'm actually playing yarn chicken at the moment because I'm really nervous that I'm not gonna have enough yarn. This is all the yarn I've got left. <gasps> and I have to finish off Gosh. this side of the shawl and knit another belt. So that's a bit scary. <sighs> Is there another colour you might use? No, I just have to order some more yarn. Oh, okay. But it's coming on very well and I'll definitely have it finished next time you see me. Now, before I forget, I'd like to remind our Shetland and Marina patrons that the audio podcast for our live event with Tina from Freer Fibres is available for you to listen to now. You can find it on our Patreon page and you'll be able to download it to your favourite podcast app via your private RSS feed so that you can listen at your convenience. And Tina is offering all the Fruity Knitting patrons a 15% discount of all her yarn from her online store, which is really fantastic. So I'm sure after those of you who listen to the podcast that you'll be really inspired to look through her yarns. So as our longer term viewers know, life has been really tough for us since October last year. A lot of the work I was doing for Fruity Knitting had to be put on hold while I was taking care of Andrew and while we were trying to find a way for him to survive. And it's been very difficult for me now to adjust to my new life without Andrew because we were so close together for 25 years. But I am really doing my best to keep Fruity Knitting going, primarily because Fruity Knitting is my only source of income, but also Andrew really loved producing the show. He was very proud of it. He had a lot of plans for it, and I know he'd be very happy that we're continuing on with it. To be honest, right now, I'm actually just doing all my work on automatic. I feel very numb, but I do hope that over time, some, some of my genuine joy for doing this work will slowly come back, particularly as my grief kind of gets a bit more manageable. But Madeline and I are very grateful for the ongoing financial support of our patrons and our patrons are our only source of income. So we do ask that if you are watching the show to please support our work by becoming a patron. And you can do that by following the link that's on the screen or the live link that's in the description box below. You can pick your level of support and it's easy and flexible. So we thank you very much for doing that. Now what I'm leading on to is that I have run out of the backlog of material that I had and I desperately need to get out and do some more interviews. So over the last few weeks I've been planning a trip to the UK, particularly in the area of Yorkshire, but we'll also end up in London to do a series of interviews. And I've got some great interviews lined up with some really exceptional guests. So provided nothing goes wrong with COVID, there's no massive hiccups, we should come back with some great content for you that should knock your socks off. <laughs> One guest in particular has been at the top of Andrew's list for me to interview for a few years and he has finally agreed to an interview. 
So I'm very grateful for that and I know Andrew would be totally thrilled. I just wish Andrew was here to help me. There is a tremendous amount of work um, that goes on behind the scenes. I always do a lot of preparation for my interviews. I do a lot of research by myself and then I work together with the, the guest. And there's like whenever Andrew and I used to go off and do a series of interviews that was usually around a festival, we would be working crazy intense hours. It's just really hard work and you're just going, going, going the whole time. So, you know, I th there's all the hours of driving. You have to drive to the to the guest. You've got a, the hours of setting up all your equipment and then doing all the filming and then packing up all your equipment afterwards. And then you drive back to your hotel. And in the evening, you spend quite a long time, a few hours, going through all this precious footage. And it's precious because of all of the hours that you've spent in preparation beforehand and the cost of travel and accommodation. It's all tied up in this footage, so you have to keep this footage safe. So you have to go through and, fi and file it correctly so that you can find it later, and then back it all up. And just to give you an idea, I'm taking hard disks of three terabytes with me so that we can back up this footage and keep it safe. And then after you've done that, you have to reformat all your cards and you have to recharge all the batteries up so they're ready for the next time. So there's a ton of work that goes on behind the scenes. And most of that Andrew was doing uh, so that I could just concentrate on organizing the guest and being in front of the camera with a guest. Now, he's not here. I have to do all of that. <laughs> I am taking Madeline with me and she's been doing her best to teach herself some of the things that Andrew was doing, but I will still have to have my eye on it and do a lot of it myself and I will be doing all the driving. So that actually means that to, in order to get the same amount of work that Andrew and I would do together, it's going to take me over twice as long because I have to also make sure that I'm not working so crazily that I burn out because I'm still under the circumstances. So it means that for the whole month of September, there won't be an episode because I can't produce a good quality episode and do all of that work at the same time. It's just way too much. But I just wanted to let our patrons know I am not slacking. Okay, I'm, I will be working really hard to bring you back some great content that you will feel inspired by and learn a lot from. It's going to be really good. I'm super excited about this trip. Yeah. Heaps of good interviews coming up. So Madeline, I, I don't want to ever promise anything that we can't deliver, but hopefully Madeline just can do a, a couple of very basic, very short, extremely poorly edited vlogs just to check in with you, travel vlogs, and, say, and show a little bit of the behind the scenes and just say, so this is where we are right now and give you a bit of a peek without giving a, away too much content. So I, I can't promise that because actually Madeline is studying full time. She's doing a psychology degree. She's in her last year. And when she's not helping me on this trip in September, she should actually be writing up her thesis. So <laughs> you can see we're really, really busy. We're not slacking. We're doing our best. Just bear that in mind, patrons. And we're very grateful, of course, to your for your support. So hopefully she will put out some very basic, a few very basic vlogs. Now, I do, do want to also say that at the beginning of August, I took one week's holiday off and I went up to Sweden to visit my good friend, Sophia Kammerborn. Sophia's been on our show a couple of times already. And this was my first time in Sweden and I really enjoyed Scandinavia. I find Scandinavia, Sweden, but also Scandinavia, I find so peaceful. She did all the driving, but I just kept thinking, there's no cars on the road. It's such easy driving. Like I'm still freaking out of the German autobahns and how the, the Porsches will just whiz past you at the speed of a space ship going it's, by. It's, it's nuts. It's really freaky yeah. for me. So, but I just, so I found Scandinavia just very relaxing and peaceful. And Sophia really looked after me. She took me to some beautiful areas in her where she, around where she lived and showed me some old ruins and some abbeys. And we did some swimming and some hiking and some knitting. So during that time, I just didn't want to do any work at all. But we did end up taking a little bit of footage just to show off her latest hat design, which is called Between the Lines. And we took this footage on a pretty rainy day, actually. It was in the woods just outside her house. 
And the rain is always, well, not the rain, but a cloudy sky is always good for lighting. Mm. But the rain did, did make us a bit wet and certainly my knitting got wet and sticky, but that was fun. And her daughter, Sophia's daughter, Ella, she did the filming. She's very helpful and lovely. So I've taken just a little snippet of that footing and I've edited it together with the charming voice of Bing Crosby singing an old classic for you. So that's coming up now. Beautiful dreamer, wake unto me. Starlight and dewdrops are waiting for thee. Sounds of the rude world heard in the day. Lulled by the moonlight have all passed away. Beautiful dreamer, queen of my song, list while I woo thee with soft melody. Gone are the cares of life's busy throng, beautiful dreamer. I'm starting a new project now that also uses stranded knitting and I'm very excited about it. Last episode I teased mum because she and dad made the decision to just keep the two crochet animals in the background that were actually intended for my little cousins Simba and Leia. Well to make up for it mum gave me this book here and suggested that I find a pattern to knit for them myself. This book is really great, it's filled with classic jumpers and cardigans, most of which use cables or stranded colour work. And the book is published by Rowan and all the designs are made by Martin Story. By the way, we have an interview with Martin Story back in episode 72 if you're interested. Martin is one of the, of the UK top designers, he's a fantastic designer and he's also a really lovely person. Yeah. Well, all the designs are made for children between the ages of six months and four years, so they'll all be too small for Simba, who is seven, and Leia is already four years old. And I basically think if I was to make them garments, I want them to last at least two years, so I decided to go for this gorgeous tote bag instead. It's wonderful, and I've knit two different versions of them, one for each girl, and they can use them as their knitting bags if they want. So here's a picture of the bag which is called Folk Bag and there's also a pattern for a matching scarf called Folk Scarf. For now I think I'll only do two bags because by the time I'm finished I'm sure I'll be ready to knit something different. The pattern uses the Rowan Felted Tweed. Mum had some leftover colours in the yarn from previous projects which meant we only needed to buy the background colour which is called clay. So the pattern is written in pieces and sewn together but mum is rewriting it for me so I can knit all the colour work in the round which will be a lot easier. So in the original pattern all the dolls have red tops and green skirts or pants but because we have so many leftover colours in this fine tweed, or felted tweed, mm -hmm. uh, we decided I could give the dolls different coloured clothes on the top and bottom rows. So these are the colours of the first bag. All the dolls will have blue bottoms and either cherry red or pink tops. Yeah. And, and the these are the colours for the second bag. Yeah, I need that. Um, I think in this one, all the dolls will have orangey red tops and either blue or green bottoms. And for the hair and boots... It's like playing with those paper dolls when you're a kid and you dress them up, you yeah. put clothes on them. Yes, <laughs> and I get to dress up my own dolls. <laughs> um, for the... For the 
blue hair and boots. We didn't have any felted tweed left, so we're just using some Alice Starmore yarn that mum had left over. So they should whip up pretty quickly, as long as I don't make so many mistakes. Yeah. The I think they're going to be 20 centimetres by 20 centimetres. Although the original pattern has 10 dolls in a row and I've made it so you're knitting 12 do dolls. Yeah. So it might be something like 30 centimetres by 20. Yeah. So Simba and Leia, you can watch the progress of your very own knitting bags and think about which one of them you would like to have. Yes. <laughs> what colourway? So we have to say goodbye now. Thank you for spending time with us. Coming up is... A great interview on knitting with wire or crocheting with wire. And don't forget to watch right to the very end to see a little update on Simba and Leia's extreme knitting in the Australian bush. So we'll see you as soon as we can. Enjoy your knitting. Bye. Bye. My guest today is the designer behind Malika, Soraya Hossein. Soraya makes exquisitely beautiful jewellery by knitting and crocheting with wire and typically her designs are really colourful. She uses lots of beading, Swarovski crystals and small amounts of luxury hand dyed yarn. And I was first introduced to Soraya and her work during the Edinburgh Yarn Festival so I've been really keen to interview her now for nearly a year so it's great to finally have this opportunity to do so. So thank you for inviting us to your home here in North London and for coming on Fruity Knitting. It's my pleasure. Thank Good. You. So you studied law and you became a, and worked as a solicitor and then you became a full-time mum for your four kids who are mm -hmm. now young adults. Mm -hmm. um, so if, as an introduction for the viewers, can you just tell us how you learned your craft and how it developed to become a full-time business? Well, my journey into the jewellery making really started with a, it was a family holiday to South Africa um, around 2003. Um, we went to South Africa and I discovered these women uh, who were making handmade bracelets on the beach in Durban. Uh, very colourful, you know, really grabbed my attention, um, made, and they were constructed of, it's called memory wire, which sort of, it's a spiral that, that spirals around your wrist. I bought a few as gifts, um, brought them home, and I was just quite intrigued by them. And I thought, well, let me have a go at trying to make some of these myself. So I went down that rabbit hole of buying all the materials, and I and I made quite a few of these bracelets yeah. and started selling them. So it was more sort of the beaded jewellery at that point. Um, but it was just playing with the colours, playing with the beads, I read sort of beading magazines and, and books on, on beaded jewellery and I started making a few pieces. And that's how it really started. Um, and I was selling them at sort of school fairs and, you know, craft fairs, local fairs. Um, and, and then you came across knitting wire, didn't you? Same. Yeah, then I, uh, I was in an art shop one day and I discovered this, um, this packet of wire and there were these, all these sort of colours, sort of a packet of 20 colours. And it had a reference to sort of knitting on the back of this packet. And it was sort of like a light bulb moment. And I thought, oh, you know, this looks quite interesting. Let me sort of buy a few. Because you'd been knitting all your life, hadn't you? Yeah, I've yeah. been. I mean, that's my sort of go-to craft. I've always knitted, I think, from the age of seven. You know, we were all taught in school to knit. And um, so I took this wire home and I started experimenting with it. Um, and then again, it was sort of that I must learn more about this. So I looked into 
if there had been wire knitting before. There was a few sort of books I'd found that were written by American mm -hmm. women who'd, who'd sort of, you know, made a few pieces with wire, more sort of sculptural pieces yeah. than jewellery. Um, and then I think in 2010, I went out on a limb um, and I applied for one of the biggest mainstream knitting shows called the Knitting and Stitching Show. Um, you know, it's been going for sort of 30 years now and it's sort of the main one that everyone goes to in London. Um, I secured a stand there and I thought, right, this is it. I'm going to go for it. I mean, this is, it's, it's, I've tested, I've tested the pieces. People like the look of it. They seem to like to wear it. Um, let me try and make this into a proper business. And the response was pretty good, wasn't it? It was very good. I mean, at the show, the, the very first show that I did, I took ready to wear jewellery. So it was very much, you know, you see the jewellery, you like it, you buy it. But what I found was that people who came to visit me on, on the stand wanted to have a go. You know, they were saying, well, we're knitters. You know, how can we make this? You, I mean, how can you say that this is knitted? They couldn't sort of, it didn't compute. Well, how can you knit and make jewellery? Um, can you teach us, you know, do you have kits? And so I thought, well, actually, this is quite a good um, revenue. Revenue, way, yeah. yeah, and it's a, it's another it's another product that I could bring to the market. Um, and so the following year, I brought um, some very basic kits. It was just bracelet making kits, and I provided the wire, I provided all the materials, I provided, like, the instructions, and I demonstrated as well. So... People were just absolutely amazed by it, and it, it just really took off. I mean, because the show is geared towards crafters. Yeah, people um, want to do it themselves. People are there to, to find things that they can make themselves, and so they were just really, you know, quite positive about it. And I did very well on that, that second year where I started with the kids. And then <clears throat> um, you were saying also that the Tits Out Collective and Edinburgh Yarn Festival most recently have really expanded you to... Yeah, so I think I've been, I've been going in the UK for since 2010, um, but it was very much the mainstream and I didn't really have an international audience. Um, but when Countess of Blaze, um, she started her campaign, which is called the Tits Out yeah. Collective... Um, I really got and I and I took part and I I, I really got recognised internationally. Okay, now you were born and raised here in London. Yeah, but your heritage is uh, both Persian and Bangladeshi. Yes. So yes. I'm wondering how these three very different cultures may have influenced your designing. For example, do you feel like you've been really inspired by the very traditional and classical jewellery making of the Asian mm -hmm. cultures? Mm -hmm. And also, where do you think the British influence comes through? Well, I grew up watching Bollywood movies. I mean, you know, we used to go to all-night cinemas and watch these old Indian movies. Um, and I was always so mesmerised by the outfits, the, the jewellery that they'd wear, um, more so the, the older style of jewellery. Um, and I grew up, you know, seeing gold jewellery and my mother's sort of old bits of jewellery. This um, is an example, isn't it? Yeah, so this is, this is one of my, my mother's um, earrings. And it's, it's a very traditional, very simple sort of piece that people would buy. And it's, it's quite light. Yeah. Um, so not as expensive because the gold is, it's quite light. It's very typical of, of what you'd get in what she used to wear. And, and this was in Bangladesh. So it's very typical of the jewellery there. And what can you tell <coughs> us about, um, what's the enameling called? Is it menakari? How do you say yeah, it? Yeah. So, um, the Persian influence is really, uh, the, the techniques that the the old uh, the old artisans used to use. Uh, so there there are two sort of techniques that I'm quite drawn to, and that's the filigree work, which is um, the process of gold wires being uh, twisted and and curled and soldered into place. Um, and my mother's earrings are an example of the filigree work. Um, and the second uh, technique is called minikari which is um, a form of enamelling and it's a way of adding colour to gold work uh, where you sort of put enamel within spaces that you've created with gold wire. So those two processes have really influenced uh, my designs and I think 
it has been sort of subliminal to begin with. Uh, I didn't realize that they were quite influential in the way that I design. Um, but when having researched the techniques, I've, I've seen how there are similarities in, in the, you know, the traditional techniques brought over from, uh, to India from uh, Persia um, and what I create, what I end up creating and the shapes that I like to create. Now, what about British influence? Does that come through in any way? Well, I think the British influence is more with the elegant, elegant lines. It's very clean. It's not as, you know, in your face as, as some of the sort of Asian jewellery can be. It's, it's very classical, I think, and, and it's quite symmetrical. So I think that's more where the British influence comes in. Okay, so we've got a lot of things here on the table and you do use a variety of materials. I do. So I thought if you could just go through and show us the materials mm -hmm. that you use and just talk about why you've chosen to work with them. Well, as I said, with the um, my influences, with my Asian influences, I, I always get drawn to the gold wire. Um, so I use a lot of the gold, this is gold-plated copper wire. Um, so I use a lot of the gold wire. I also use um, silver-plated copper wires. Uh, and then for the colour, my love of colour, I, I try and use the enamelled uh, wires. And sometimes I actually add them together and I'll create sort of two, two tonal effects with the different colours. But it's a way of injecting um, some colour into my work um, because I don't, I don't really like to stick to sort of monotone gold and silver. I like to inject the colour into it. So I use um, 0.2 millimetre uh, wires um, and up to 0.25 millimetre wires. I don't really go for anything thicker. Um, when you start trying to knit with, with wire, you'll find that it can be quite tough on your fingers. Um, <clears throat> so the thinner, the easier. The thinner, it's, it's more pl flexible, it's more, you can manipulate it better, um, and it doesn't hurt your fingers, and you can knit for hours, really, with, with that gauge. I think anything above 0.25 millimetres and you'll give up. And I know a lot of people have said, oh, I've tried wire knitting and no, it's not for me. And I said, well, it's probably because it was too thick, mm. you know. So what, what uh, size needles <clears throat> do you knit with that? And, and do you know what your actual gauge is roughly? Uh, yeah, roughly. I mean, it, it, it varies according to the needle size. So the needles I use are sort of from 0.25 up to, no, sorry, uh, from 2.25 up to 2.75 millimeter in the knitting needles and then in crochet when I crochet with the wire I use a two millimeter hook um, and sometimes I go down to a 1.75 sometimes even smaller because I like the fineness that mm. it, it creates when you when you use a smaller tool. Okay and what about the beading we've got some here in front of us. Yeah so the uh, I, I use um, Swarovski crystal in in a lot of the pieces I will always use the crystal in, in most of the pieces. Um, I incorporate semi-precious stones as well. So I've got sort of um, some stones here, um, freshwater pearl as well. Uh, and it depends on what I'm trying to create. So when I get my design brief or if I have a client who wants a piece made to match something, then I'll, I'll look at the colours and I'll, I'll look at the style and I'll, it depends on what I'm trying to create. So. And you also use luxury hand-dyed yarn. So I do, yeah. Tell us a bit about that's, that. That's actually quite a recent thing. So that I introduced for uh, Edinburgh Yarn Festival. Yeah, so. um, and this is one of the collaborations um, I had with Countess Ablaze. And she um, specially hand-dyed this yarn for me. In, in I called it my thistle colourway because I wanted a collection to bring to Edinburgh um, that was related to Scotland and it's the National Flower of Scotland. Um, so she created this specifically for me um, and I made some mixed media pieces from that. So I've I've incorporated the wire and the yarn into okay. into piece. So that's is, yeah. So that's um a cuff that you would so this piece has been knitted with the wire, incorporating the Sros crystal yeah. and then I've I've created, yes, so I've created yeah. some cabling on the back and it's worn as a cuff. It's called the window cuff. Okay. Um, and I've also made, I think you can see there are some earrings, some yeah. earrings which, again, it incorporates the two techniques. So you have the wire and that's crocheted and then you've got the hand-dyed yarn, which also has the crystals running around the bottom. So are you only using fingering weight? 
I only use fingering weight because the beads need to be able to be threaded on. So yeah. if it's too thick, you will not be able to get the beads on. Um, and you don't want to use big beads because um, they're heavy. Yeah. So you want to keep the beads as small as possible. Um, and therefore, you need to use yarn that's thin enough for the beads to go on. Yeah. But I can imagine you <clears throat> also don't want it to be too wobbly. You want a fairly rigid structure, don't you? Yeah. So, yeah. so yeah. it's not like lace. I, I wouldn't it's, use lace. I think yeah. lace, it would just hang and it, would, it, it wouldn't, as you say, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be rigid enough. Um, so fingering is actually the ideal yeah. weight to use. And actually, I think these Merino singles is probably the best because it doesn't split. Um, but you can use any any sort of fingering weight yarn. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Now, I actually knew, I've known for a while <clears throat> that you can knit with wire to create jewellery, but I didn't know that you could actually also crochet. Yeah. So do you find either crochet or knitting to be better suited for jewellery making with wire? And Like you're using both. Why yeah. do you use both? Well, I find, I mean, I, I, I would identify myself as a knitter. I've, I've knitted for most of my life. Um, I've only recently learned to crochet. I think it's only been about 10 years since I learned to crochet. But I find that the two techniques are, they lend themselves to different effects. So with the knitting, you can create quite straight shapes. You can, um, when you want to um, design something that's quite angular, quite straight, the knitting is is brilliant. Uh, when it comes to more curved or, or circular shapes, then then crochet is probably the best one to use because you have the one crochet hook, you have one stitch that you're working at at a time, um, and so you it's sort of free form. You can you can guide it to where you want to guide it. So you've got more flexibility with crochet in a way. I think so. I think yeah. you can create more fluid shapes with with crochet, whereas with knitting, you're following a line. Um, and the only way you can create sort of fluidity is through decreasing or increasing stitches. Um, for example, if I show you... Um, These here? The, this was the uh, piece that I created for Tits Out Collective. And this has been crocheted simply because I wanted to create the shape of the bosom and uh, also to have a piece that went below it and the only way I could achieve that was to use crochet I don't think I could have done something like that if if it was sort of on on a straight piece of knitting okay okay so what <clears> are you <throat> using which stitch are you using with crochet is that a, a single crochet or a double crochet it's it's double crochet well yeah. in English terms yeah. it's double crochet um, and I only know the very basic stitches in foot. I know as much as I need to achieve what, what I yeah. want to achieve. So is this something the different? earrings. Yeah. So the, these are the earrings also, again, created using crochet as a technique. Yeah. Okay. And with knitting, are you using, it looks like garter stitch. This is knitted, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, it's knitted. Can I I'll yeah. lift it up? So that's actually knitted using short row shaping. And it's the short row shaping that will make it spiral. I haven't manip. I, I get asked this question so many times. Well, how do you make it twist? Do you twist it yourself? Do you manipulate it? It's actually so you're creating a fan on one edge, um, and if you keep doing that, it needs to go somewhere, and then it starts to spiral, and it will keep its shape. So that's quite an interesting way of creating something three dimensional yeah. in knitting. Yeah, it's really beautiful. Yeah. And I can see here, just quickly show this one under mm -hmm. here. This is, you can see that the garter stitch is actually like a really good flat canvas, yeah. isn't it? So this was actually one of the very first pieces that I made uh, way back in 2010. Um, and I've incorporated rose quartz and Swarovski crystal. It's, it's, a, it's one of the very basic first shapes that I created. So it's a straight piece of knitting, um, but quite effective. Mm, it's beautiful. Now, in 2017, you mm -hmm. designed or created a full-length skirt. Yes. And, um, and that was for an exhibition, out of wool and wire, mm -hmm. and that was for an exhibition entitled Where Wool Meets, mm -hmm. I think. That's right. Yeah. And since then, you've designed a top to go with it, mm -hmm. and both garments are going to be worn and displayed in a fashion show at yes. Vogue Knitting Live. Yes. That's <laughs> happening just in two weeks' time, and, mm -hmm. and we're going to be there, so I hope to get some footage of mm -hmm. it. So just tell us about creating that project. I had a collaborative exhibition in 2017. It was with two other textile artists. Um, 
and my contribution was to produce a skirt. I actually have a picture of it here, although it's at, at, in New York now. So that, that's the picture of the skirt. Um, and it was constructed by knitting panels. I think there were 14 panels and I hand stitched them together and it incorporated yarn, wire and the crystals. Um, and it was really um, documenting my journey and my transition from, from yarn to wire. It was designed surrounding my sort of concern for the environment. Um, the design of the piece was really about the blackened earth that's been overworked, you know, over time. Um, so the black yarn is the, the blackened earth. And then I go into sort of the black wire and then into the gunmetal wire. And it's the crystals are meant to resemble twining um, stems or vines coming up through the blackened earth to show that there's there's hope for, for sort of re renewal and new growth. And the wire, because of the fragility of the wire, the story was that um, there's although there's it's fragile and the earth is 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 quite fragile it still has the potential for new growth so it's so that was the story of the, of the skirt um, and also it was a skirt because we need to protect what surrounds us so I wanted it to be a sort of circular shape and it's going to be worn by somebody isn't it it is it is it's quite small but I'm sure it will fit somebody um, it's going to be walking be on the, the runway um, at Vogue Knitting Live. Um, I submitted the skirt. I mean, the skirt took me three months to make, at, you know, way back in 2017. Um, I submitted it for the competition. I made um, a top to go with it. So it's... Which is just it, a pretty <coughs> short... It's just a cropped, short crop yeah. top, and I called it the earth crop top. Um, and again, it was constructed similar technique in panels. I then hand-stitched together... Um, and then I had a, a set of jewellery to go with it. And I think that one of the items will be in uh, Vogue, the Vogue Knitting Spring Edition. So that's, that's quite great. exciting. That's yeah. really exciting. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay, now some of our viewers will definitely <clears throat> want to try out knitting your designs. Mm -hmm. So can you suggest which kits are good to start with and even give us a little uh, mini lesson on the basics? Okay. Uh, so this is quite a good kit to start with. It's a straight piece of knitting. It's garter stitch. It's four stitches that you're working with. Um, and it's not so technical. You don't have to really follow a lot of... Uh, the instructions are not very difficult. Um, and it teaches you how to incorporate beads as well as you go along. Um, you can also finish it quite easily. So you have... Um, pieces that you sew on at the end and everything's provided in the kit to make, to make you know, this really gorgeous uh, choker, which can also be worn as a bracelet. Um, so that is quite a good one. Um, there, there it is again in another colourway. Yeah. The other one is actually uh, probably the brooch kit. Oh, yes, yeah. here. Um, so this is, again, a straight piece of knitting. You're knitting a square piece and then you simply put it into the brooch frame and you get all the materials and all the uh, pieces you need to complete and make this complete brooch. And you've done that as a, a thistle? Yeah, so this was part of the uh, Edinburgh Yarn Festival. It was part of the thistle collection. Um, what I'd say with when you start to knit with wire is you need to take things slowly don't I know it's it, it's it's knitting, but don't treat it like regular knitting. You want to take your time over each stitch, um, and the neater the, the the slower you are, the neater your your work will be, and the better finish you'll get. So it's not a race. You know you're, you're only dealing with. I mean, there's only seven stitches here, so you're only dealing with a few stitches at a time. Take your time over it, um, and you'll create a really lovely result at the end. Um, also, be very careful not to kink the wire. You know, any bends or kinks, if you keep, it stresses the wire and it creates a weak point and it can break. So try to keep the wire as straight as possible. Um, I call it knitting with wire, but what you're actually doing is shaping the wire with your knitting needle. So it's like a shaping tool. It's like any other jewellery tool. You're using it to shape the material. Um, so you take your time over each stitch. 
And you've already beaded your wire, haven't you? Yes. Yeah, so when um, when you start any piece of jewellery, when it's it's incorporated the beads, you would pre-thread everything you need to pre-thread before you cast on. So I've pre-threaded all the crystals I need to, to, to make this piece. And then I've started knitting. So I've cast on, um, there's seven stitches here. And this is one of these spiral necklaces. This is, um, again, it's one of the kits. It's called the 12 necklace kit. And I think there's a finished yeah. one. It's very beautiful. At the front yeah. there. Okay. So it's actually, um, it's the technique of short row shaping in this design. And what I'm doing is, and it's got, you use garter stitch throughout with, with all my projects when it, when it's knitting rather than crochet, you use garter stitch because you don't actually see stitch definition with wire. What you're doing is you're creating the space between the wire. So it's the mesh that you're creating and you're not going to see any stitch definition with, with wire. You're just going to see the mesh. So it's always going to be garter stitch, very simple stitch. Um, and then I, I will knit and take my time. And the other tip I would give is, I always ease each stitch before I knit it. So I ease the niche by, I, I ease the stitch by putting the needle in purlwise, um, and then I'll knit the stitch. And by easing the stitch, you've just created that tiny lift and for you to get the needle in. Because sometimes if you're a tight knitter, uh, it can be difficult to get the needle in, mm. you know. So it's it can be a struggle just ease it first and then it's so simple to knit it's quite fluid then if you ease and I tend to do that for every stitch because it's it makes it quicker because you're not struggling to get into each stitch and it also neatens the row, row below um, so that's that's a very handy tip it makes it more uniform yes it does. Gauge. it does yeah. great and then you'd sort of carry on. So this is um, short row shaping, which, you know, you're doing a few stitches and then you're turning and you're going back on those stitches. And it's that simple technique that creates the lift at one end and then it starts to automatically spiral. So I'm not manipulating this. It will start after about 10 repeats. It starts to, to twist um, and it will keep its shape. It doesn't come out of shape because of the technique. So that's really, yeah, that's really the knitting side of it. And how long before you have to stick in one of these? So th the pattern will tell you where to do it. With this particular design, I'm adding it to the edge. Mm -hmm. So the pattern will say, right, row one, first stitch, you're adding the crystal. So what I do is I bring it up right to the top, hold it up against the needle, and then I knit that crystal in and that's in now it's incorporated into the work so it's very simple isn't it it is very simple and it's it's a bit like um if you look at a, a sort of fair isle or, or stranded color work the chart will tell you where to put the crystals in so when you get to the stitch where you want that color the crystal to come in you add you bring the crystal up and you knit it in so it's it's very similar to color work and it's very similar to sort of fair isle where you've got all your beads, all waiting to be to be brought up. Okay, yeah. let's see very quickly a little bit of crochet. Okay, so this is actually a piece that I'm I've prepared to make some earrings, um, and I've threaded them with these colours here. You can see. Mm -hmm. um, and what I do when I crochet is I create a circle. by chain. So I'll sort of chain a few stitches. And I'm using two strands of 0.2 millimeter wire um, to give me a sort of a, a slightly tonal look to it. And then I will work within that circle. Start creating the shape of the earring. And again, take your time. Don't try and rush this. Um, Wire can be quite temperamental and it, it likes to curl up and, and do its own thing, so you have to sort of tame it. Well, thanks so much for showing us that. That's really, really helpful and, and very, very beautiful.
Um, so just to finish off now, can you tell us what are some of the things that you've done over the years that have really helped you grow, both as a business and a designer? Well, I actually went back to uh, formal study. Um, I studied in Hatton Garden, which is the heart of the jewellery quarter in London. Um, and I learnt the traditional manufacturing um, and design of jewellery. Um, and it was really useful. I, I learnt sil- silversmithing and, you know, soldering and the formal techniques and mm-hmm. the tools that you use. Um, but most importantly, I got the insider knowledge um, knowing where to go for, for components, knowing where to go to get processes done. Um, so that was really, really useful for me. And it, I think it's it's enhanced the way I approach things in my business. Um, and my contacts, it's, it's increased my, my contact list. Mm. Um, also working, I found recently I've been working in collaboration with... Um, other yarn dyers and people within the industry and that helps to combat the loneliness sometimes Mm -hmm. when you're working for yourself and you're at home you're in a home studio you don't see people so it's good to collaborate um definitely and it helps you connect with the outer world and and you get access to a new set of um audience or customers you you? do you do so you you're helping each other really and you're promoting each other so that is that's that's been quite a good, uh, a significant um, development in my business. I've collaborated with quite a few people since EYF. Um, I also, you know, I, I run an, I've set up a knitting group locally um, and that's been very good for support. I think it's very important to give back to the local community, but also to have some sort of support. Um, and feedback on new designs and things and feedback yeah. and and I've met some wonderful people and some of them are designers themselves so it's um I think it's very important to share I think you know it's it's one thing to create things and and to create a business and have people admire it but I think you need to share information as well so and, that's and great that's yeah. part of giving back and it also helps doesn't it it helps to share information that people sometimes think that you're giving your, your business away, but actually yeah. it's a very good thing to do for yeah, business I mean, as well. Within the jewellery industry, it's it's very well known that everyone is very tight-lipped about what they do. They don't want to share their techniques, but I don't think that's the right approach. I think you should be able to... I, I, it does enhance your, your craft because you're learning as well. When you share information, people give you feedback and you can then go on and, and sometimes they'll say, well, I, I think that shape would be better for... For, for that whatever you know um, bespoke design um, and then it will make you think of different designs mm. so sometimes someone else's input will will create another thought of a train of thought for you to think well let me just sort of try this design now mm. um, so you're not so closed I think you can be quite closed off if you if you're not willing to share and um, get feedback good Okay, well, it's been really great to see your work and to see how you do it and to Mm -hmm. hear your story. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. My pleasure. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you for coming. Let's say goodbye to the viewers. Bye. Bye.